So that's the eulogy. Not particularly long, but there is a lot in it. Engels' approach is to outline all of Marx's major accomplishments. He mentions the many different interests of Marx and celebrates his contributions in theory and practice. Of course, by keeping it short, he doesn't stop to explain or elaborate on these topics. Let's take a look, closer look at the text. We'll go through it one bit at a time. First, Engels calls Marx the greatest living thinker. This is a pretty tall claim, but it might be justified. Uh, at the time, Einstein was only four years old. Sigmund Freud was 27, but he wouldn't make his major discoveries or write his major texts until years later. So, before his death, Marx might have very well been the greatest living thinker. Even for non-Marxists, he would at least have to be in the running. On a similar note, uh, there was an online poll by the BBC um, in 1999 that found Karl Marx to be the greatest thinker of the millennium, a taller claim than Engels. Uh, Einstein came in second place. So you can see that Engels' claim is uh, actually mild compared to the uh, assessment by the BBC. The next part of the speech begins with a great line. Just as Darwin discovered the law of development of organic nature, Marx discovered the law of development of human history. Here, Engels is drawing a comparison between Darwin's theory of evolution of species with Marx's theory of historical materialism. There are many similarities between these two theories. They both explain how changes happen. Darwin writes about changes in organisms, while Marx writes about changes in the ways humans organize society. Both theories can be called materialist, meaning that they look at the real material world to find the reasons why changes happen. They do not say the changes happen because God said so. They look to find real world reasons why these changes occur. Darwin found some animals have traits better suited for survival and reproduction, and Marx found that tensions or contradictions between different groups of people drive the change in society. On this same topic, Engels mentions that art, religion, politics, etc. cannot be part of man's life before he has fed and housed himself, since our material needs must be met before we can engage in philosophy and culture. This means our philosophies and our culture will be shaped by how we meet our material needs and how we organize labor and production. Capitalist culture will be very different from feudal culture, and both will be very different from slave societies. Marx's contribution was to recognize that material needs come first and then shape the rest of society. Next, Engels says that Marx discovered a special law of motion governing capitalism. Here he refers to what Marx calls surplus value. Before Marx, there were many critiques of capitalism, but the critique was very different from Marx. Other socialists and anti-capitalists pointed to the extreme poverty of the working class and the gross excesses of the capitalists. They pointed to the long hours, sometimes 16 hours a day, that the workers suffered through. Some children starved while others slaved away in factories. Marx was moved by these issues as well, but he took his critique further. He was looking to make a scientific critique of the system. Surplus value became that scientific component. Before Marx, economists knew that capitalists owned the means of production and that they hired workers and they were able to make large amounts of money by doing this. Marx's theory of surplus value shows that it is the workers who have made the money called profit. For a capitalist, there is no reason to hire a worker unless that worker will make more money than you have to pay him. If you pay him the same amount of money that the worker makes for you, then you don't gain anything. The difference in the value that the workers create and the value that they are paid is surplus value. Capitalists live on surplus value, on this extra value that the workers make, but they do not get. 
Without surplus value, there is no reason for capitalists to bother with production. Understanding surplus value is essential to a scientific critique of capitalism. It shows that workers must be exploited, because otherwise the capitalist system cannot function. Without surplus value, we only see the horrors the system produces. With surplus value, we can now see the underlying reason why things are so horrible and why capitalism creates such misery. Engels goes on to congratulate Marx for these two discoveries, historical materialism and surplus value, but he adds that Marx made contributions to a wide range of disciplines, including mathematics. Now, to be honest, I had never heard uh, of Marx's work in math, so I had to do some research with this one. It turns out that while he was working on Capital, his major theoretical work, he wrote to Engels saying that he needed to take a break from writing to learn more math to use in uh, his economics. So, for a while, Marx did nothing but study math and learn everything he could as quickly as possible. He ended up writing some mathematical manuscripts. I'm not an expert on math myself, and I confess I haven't read the entirety of his manuscripts. But I did gather that they were largely on the topic of differential calculus and the history of the development of differential calculus. I can't say whether he made a significant contribution to the field or not, because I simply don't know enough about it. The fact that he wrote on the topic in itself, I consider impressive, uh, especially given his undeniable contributions to so many other disciplines. Next, Engels goes on to list some of Marx's political achievements. This includes writing for a number of publications, it seems that most revolutionaries tended to get published in a variety of left-wing or socialist publications. For example, both Lenin and Trotsky published a variety of articles. Engels also cites uh, Marx's creation of the International Working Men's Association. Later, this was called the First International. There have been three other internationals since then, each with their own strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we won't get into them today. And uh, there have even been calls for a fifth international. Calling these organizations international has its roots in Marx's theory. Marx saw in capitalism a tendency to create what he called a world market. Today we call this globalization. Same thing. As companies merge and grow, they cover more and more of the globe. And while there are differences between one culture and the next, we all have in common that we live in a capitalist world, and the vast majority of us work not for ourselves, but for a boss. Since capital always tries to cross borders to expand production overseas and sell commodities abroad, so workers must band together internationally in order to oppose capitalism. Our organizations cannot merely be national in scope, because the economy of a solitary nation simply does not exist without relation to the rest of the world. This international approach to revolution is why these revolutionary groups have been called internationals. Finally, Engels ends with stating that governments of all kinds hated Marx. Absolutist governments, meaning feudal-style dictatorships, and Republican governments, meaning those with elected officials, both hated him. Also, both conservative and liberal wings of capitalist society quote-unquote heaped slanders upon him. It is amazing to me how this is still very true, especially in the U.S. Both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party uh, disown Marxism. They wish to distance themselves from it and to not be associated with it. Uh, of course, the Republicans use the word to go on the offensive, but it is a very rare Democrat who accepts the label socialist, and I am completely unaware of any current politicians in the U.S. who call themselves Marxists. Finally, Engels ends his speech by saying that even though the ruling classes have nothing but unending hatred for Marx, he was loved by working men the world over. Of course, this isn't true of all working people, especially today, but from the lessons of this podcast series, 
you can see why a working class people have very good reason to be interested in Marx's ideas. And that's uh, the end of my commentary on Engels' uh, graveside speech. Thanks for tuning in. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.